Well, we heard from a regular, we heard a very familiar passage that we hear a lot of times in church this morning for the, uh, for the reading, the gospel, the, the uh, prodigal son. I'd um, like to talk a little bit here this morning about forgiveness. Forgiveness. Um, it, it, it appears to be easy, right? I mean, somebody comes, they say, hey, you know, I want you to forgive me. You're a Christian, right? You have to forgive me. Well, that's not always the case. Sometimes some of the biggest fights and the holding on to grudges occur sorrowfully in the church. And even worse than that, a lot of them occur in the family, which is the part, another part of that uh, prodigal son story. Um, one family, oh, I guess it was a major spat that you would have, occurred back in Genesis, and it is in uh, Genesis chapter 50, right at the very end of that book of Genesis. It says, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they says, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us? If he pays us back for all the wrong that we did to him. So they sent word to Joseph saying, your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they have committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants, the gods of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. His brothers then came, threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. I am in the place of God. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you. I will provide for your children. And then he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. Forgiveness, it's easy. Would appear to be easy, right? They, they come in, they, they really treated Joseph very badly. And he had every chance to reciprocate, but he didn't. And, and I love the phrase here in there, um, it's verse 19. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid, I am in the place of God. God, am I not here in God's house, in God's place? I will, I will certainly forgive you. Well, if you look at that, you say, well, sure, forgiveness is not, not, very, not very hard, you know. People come in, admit they're wrong, throw themselves down, and they're forgiven. Well, Max Licato tells a story. I love Max Licato's books. He tells a story of a young couple that were married and had been married for a few years, and um, for some reason, the husband was working a lot. He didn't see his wife a lot because she was working a lot. And he somehow was attracted or was someone else was attracted to him at work. And you know how it goes. One thing leads to another. Satan doesn't immediately jump from right here seeing each other in office to jumping in bed right over here. It doesn't happen that way. Satan works in, in little steps, you know, uh, bringing me coffee, maybe bringing me a donut talking to me encouragingly, uh, you know, doing and, and, and things over and above what a secretary does. Now all of a sudden, now you're here. But it was a bunch of steps. 
and maybe he saw it coming, maybe he should have stopped things, but eventually they had a, a, uh, an affair. It lasted uh, all of about one night, and the guy was so guilt-ridden, he, he couldn't believe that what he had done, you know, he was just really beating himself up because he did a bad thing. You know, any time that you do anything like that, it, it is, it's a sin. It's a sin against God. It's a sin against your wife, uh, the person that you even had the affair with. You're sinning all around. Well, he, it bothered him so much, maybe he could have kept it quiet. Maybe he could have not said anything. But he just was so guilt-ridden, he went to his wife and he said, Honey, here is what happened. I have to tell you this because I am so, so sorry. I am so ashamed. Basically, what, what did it say here? They came to him, they threw themselves down on the ground, and they said, we will be your servant. Well, he pretty much threw himself down on the ground. He said, I am so sorry. I, I, I'm just going to beg and ask that you forgive me. Oh, boy. Forgiveness appears to be easy, right? Well, it wasn't here. The lady just was dug her heels in. She just felt so violated. She felt, and she was. He did a terrible thing. He had no leg to stand on, as it were. He wanted to tell her this. Tell her that he, he had wronged her and he was asking for forgiveness. Maybe not all at once, but again, maybe in steps, he could win back her, her trust and, and her love and, and all, you know. Well, she just wasn't having it. Uh, get out, leave me alone. You did this terrible thing to me. I, I don't want to have anything to do with you. And there is a, a, a good bunch of people, and, and, and you know, if you're putting this out, there would be quite a lot of people that say, well, she was right in what she did. He sinned, he wronged her, and then he told her, and she knew, and now she made her decision. Well, the guy was devastated. He knew he had wronged this woman. He was guilt-riddled. And now he was out on his own. Well, he went, found himself a little place. He wanted to try to stay there. He wasn't going to give up. He was going to try and win back his wife who he had wronged. He um, tried calling her. He sent letters. He put notes in the mailbox to her, please, I just want to talk, please, can you ever see to forgive me? He uh, had some friends from church go and talk to her, and she just was very set in her decision. I don't want anything to do with him. I don't want him around. No, I will not forgive him. Forgiveness appears to be easy, right? Well, not here. Well, he stayed around for a while and tried everything. Finally, he just said, you know what? Um, we've, she filed for divorce. We're, we're done. So he packed up his stuff, everything he could, left town. Went to live in another town, you know, down the road somewhere. Um, actually went set up a new life for himself, uh, confessed to God, joined the church, went in, sat down, talked to the pastor. Pastor, he told him what happened, what, what his life, what the mess he had created. Pastor says, you're welcome here. Everyone in here is a sinner. Everybody that goes to church, you'll hear people say, I don't want to go to churches. It's filled with hypocrites. They're right. To some degree, all of us are sinners. And, and to some degree, all of us are, are hypocrites. And that starts right here with me. I am a sinner saved by grace. You know, when you go into a church, you think, holy, my gosh, Lord, why am I up here talking to people? 
You know, if, if they could see my heart, they'd say, well, who do you think you are? If they could read my past, they would say, look at what you've done. What do you think you're doing preaching to us? And by the same token, if I was able to look out and I was to see all of your hearts and what all you've done, I would say, holy mackerel, what's the point? <laughs> you know, we have all, we're all sinners here, saved by grace. Well, this gentleman be became part of that church and eventually found a, a, another lady. They met at a Bible study and they started seeing each other. He told her exactly what happened and how it came to be. No frills. He wanted her to know that if they were going to be together, that, she, you know, he wanted her to, to understand what was going on. Eventually, he got married, settled down, and in that other town had a family, and his life was reborn because he was told, we're all sinners, and you're welcome here. You've asked, you've asked forgiveness, and God will grant that to you. The lady, on the other hand, the young lady, just never recovered. Very hard, very, um, like, just grumbling, mean. Uh, people just stopped associating with her because she just turned... Um, angry and her life was really not at all what she had hoped it would be and someone said to her what would your life be like if you could have seen the the way and forgiven your husband what would I don't even think about that he did and I don't think I don't want you to even talk about it okay well then we won't and her life became just alone and bitter and angry and isolated. Max Locato talks in there, he says, um, as what is in what is in Joseph here in chapter or, uh, or in verse 15, they say, what if Joseph holds a, and you just listen to this term, and this is what this lady was doing. She held a grudge. Even when you say that word, it sounds bad. Grudge. Well, she did. But you would think forgiveness should be easy, right? Well, sometimes... It's not. We read again here in the prodigal son. There was a man, had two sons, didn't know the second son anything. The culture of that time, he was really entitled pretty much to nothing. The older son was first. He was second, but he goes in and he says, hey, dad, give me my money. Basically, what he was saying in that culture was, dad, you're dead to me. Because he wasn't going to get any money of anything until dad died. So when he went in and he says, hey, give me my money, um, basically, he's like, okay, dad, you're dead to me. Where's my dough? His dad shouldn't, didn't really have to do anything. But being a, a, trying to be a, a, a good father... He says, well, you know, all right, let's, let's see what we can do here. And he gave him a large portion of the money that he had. Immediately, this young man takes off, enters into wild living, and squanders his money. And I, I always like the old blues song, nobody loves you when you're down and out like 40-some 40, 40 years ago, perhaps. And it applies here. This guy had money. He had friends all around, treated them to all kinds of things. And when the money ran out, so did the friends. He was stuck. Uh, he was a Jewish boy. The worst thing that a Jewish boy could do would be to be associated with pigs. The Jews and pigs did not get along at all. The Jews just absolutely shunned them, and they were part of the Gentile people. We don't know pigs here. 
Well, here he was keeping them alive. To his own detriment, he was keeping the pigs alive, feeding them. He, he asked the, 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 the uh, owner, can I just at least eat some of what the pigs are having? And they said, no, those pods are not for you. The pods there are for the pigs. Well, he says, but like I'm starving to death. So? And I, I love the term in here. It's verse 17, chapter 15 of Luke, verse 17. And this applies so much to people nowadays. When he came to his senses. That doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen some. In order for good things to happen, in order for forgiveness to happen, in order for kindness to happen, you know, you, you have to be you know, you have to come to your senses and look around and see what's out there. Well, he came to his senses. And he says, here I am starving to death. I'm going to go back. I'm going to throw myself down and ask my father to forgive me. Well, this is the second time now in our scriptures that somebody threw themselves down on the ground. All of Joseph's brothers threw themselves down on the ground in front of Joseph begging forgiveness. This young boy comes back. His dad sees him, sees him from far off and ran to meet him. This goes against all the cultures of the day. If you really study this, this uh, parable, uh, you know, he was a rich guy, obviously, and he was probably well-known in the community and stuff. People that are rich and well-known don't run. They take their time. They walked like the Pharisees and them. They just walked along. They didn't really hurry. Hurrying is for other people. We don't hurry. But he kept a candle in the window, as it were, for his son. Looked for him every day. Saw that he was out there. Ran to him. There was a Pittsburgh Steeler guy that played a long time ago. John Kolb was his name. He was an offensive lineman. My wife took care uh, back in the, maybe it was in the 80s, of his mom who was a hospice patient. And uh, she was able to sit and visit and talk with him. And he, his dad was a pastor. And he said, I would listen to my dad talk about this prodigal son and I knew he meant me because I wasn't in church. I didn't want to do anything. I hated that, that parable. That was one of the worst things ever. If people start talking about that, I just shut them off. And he goes, but then later I got into Jesus and I became a Christian. And he says, it was amazing that what I once hated with that parable now became my favorite parable. The only place in the, in the New Testament where the Father, being God, runs out to meet the sinner who he said was me. And he said it went from being my worst parable I didn't like to, to my favorite parable. And it all was because the Father was willing to forgive the boy. Sometimes forgiveness is easy, it appears to be easy, and in this case, it looked like it was. If you read a little further, though, chapter 15, starting with verse 25, and it starts with that one of those words that you know something's going to turn here. It says, meanwhile... The older brother was in the field, came near the house, heard music and dancing, called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come home. Your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. And the next sentence is all you need to know about what's going on now with the older brother. It says, the older brother became angry and refused to go in. 
They were having a party in there. He was dead. Now he is alive. And the older brother just absolutely wasn't having it, was not forgiving. The, the father again goes out to see him, pleads with him. He answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and you never even given me uh, a, a goat. Or, or anything that I could celebrate with my friends. So when this son of yours, he wouldn't even call him his brother. He says, when this son of yours who squandered your property and prostitutes and comes home, you kill the fatted calf. Is that how you get recognition around here, dad? You take money that doesn't belong to you. You run off, you squander it all away on terrible bad things. And then you come back and you throw yourself down and you forget give him and elevate him right back up? Is that how you get recognition here in this family? He just wasn't having it. And you know, sometimes when brothers or family people become angry with each other, sometimes those are the hardest things to resolve. Sometimes it takes somebody from outside to come in to help because, you know, both the one brother came home, the other brother even refused to meet with him. So you had here a standoff. Somebody had to, to come in. We don't know how this ends, but you can see the point. Father was able to forgive him the older brother was not. There was always going to be something until somehow it was resolved. There was going to be a need for forgiveness. Well, two brothers were arguing with each other and they had been getting along, something happened. And that's a thing too, a lot of times. People will argue with each other and after you get in where you don't talk to each other or you, you alienate each other and you don't forgive each other, you think somebody will say, well, what caused it? And they'll be, oh, I don't know. We just had some issues back before. They don't even remember what caused it. But all of a sudden they don't like each other. They're, they're mad, they're brothers. And, and they don't want to be around each other. They live next to each other, and there was a stream that ran between their property. And they went out one day, and they stood, and they said, you stay on your side of the stream, I'm going to stay on my side of the stream. Don't be coming over here. That's fine with me. I don't want to come over there. So the one brother, the older brother, calls somebody, he called a carpenter, found him. He came to the house. He said, look, you got all this wood over here I bought. I'm going on vacation. I want you to build a nice big wooden spike fence all the way down across this stream, right along this stream, so he'll stay over there and I'll stay over here. The carpenter says, okay, so you're arguing and you're not getting along and you want him to be over here and you want to be over here. Yep. When I come back after a week or so, I want to see a nice big old long fence there so I don't even have to look over there at him. Guy says, I have exactly what you need. So he goes and he's thinking, when I go home, there's going to be a nice big fence. It's going to be, I won't be, have to see anybody. He won't be able to come over. And boy, oh boy, if he climbs over that fence, he is going to be in trouble. I'll have him arrested for trespassing. So he's just on vacation thinking, oh boy. So they actually left vacation early to come home. The guy pulls in the driveway, parks the car, gets out, runs around the house and goes, huh? there wasn't a fence. That carpenter built a bridge over that stream. And, and who's, on that, who's on that bridge? Oh my gosh, it's my brother. And he's like, what the heck did that carpenter do? I made specific, I wanted him to build this big fence. He must have told him to do differently. So he runs down and he gets up on the bridge and he says to his brother, what? And his brother goes, no. He says, let me, let me t tell you, I am so ashamed of not 
forgiving you. And I see this man came and you had him build a bridge so that we could get back together. Oh my gosh, whatever we had between us before, I, I forgive you because for you to take and spend and do and have somebody build a bridge so we can get back together, that is, that is just wonderful and he's crying. And the guy that was, you know, the, the brother that was the older brother, just like in there, you know, at once he was like really hard, but his heart melted. And he went over and he says, all right, he said, let's start again. Let's do, let's forgive each other and, and let's just start again. And the brother that was crying says, I, I've wanted nothing more for a long time. Sometimes forgiveness is easy. Oh, by the way, they, um, they looked for the carpenter guy. They tried to find him, and he was nowhere to be found. Nobody knew anything about him. Nobody knew where he come from, or they, they didn't know his name. They didn't know where he had gone. He showed up. Instead of building a fence, he built a bridge. And the two people, the, the two brothers got together. And you just kind of wonder, who was this guy? Divine intervention. Maybe he was an angel. Maybe something you don't know. Sometimes, though, when two people, especially family members, are fighting and butting heads with each other, it takes divine intervention to bring them together. And that's what they got here. We say it in the Lord's Prayer. Matthew 6 verse 12 forgive us our debts this is a conditional thing now in the lord's prayer this is a conditional covenant it's one of those if then if i do this then you will do that forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and right past the lord's prayer the next verse there 14 and 15 it says, Jesus says to them, if you forgive others, then God will forgive you. If you do not forgive others, then God will not forgive you. Read it. It's, it's in there right after the Lord's Prayer in Matthew, chapter 6, starting with verse 12, 13, 14, 15. See, forgiving is made harder a lot of ways. Forgiving is uh, when people do something, it's the famous exercise that everybody does. It might be the most famous exercise in the world. It's called jumping the conclusion. Everybody does that. And, and you say, well, what do you mean? Wait a minute. Where, why are you doing this? Why are you jumping the conclusion? And whoever felt like they've been wronged or whoever has a, a, a grudge, they'll say, I don't care what they say. I'm not going to like them. That person was wrong. I don't care what they, you know who they are, they. I don't care what they say. I am not going to, to like that person. And here again, forgive us our debt as we forgive others. Forgiveness is a hard thing. You know where two places where forgiveness occurs, two major places where forgiveness occurs? Number one is in a church because you know, you, you come under God's grace, you come around your friends perhaps, you've been thinking about it, you come to church, you look over and you see somebody and you say, you know what, there was a pastor came to Waynesburg uh, at one of the churches, a uh, new, new, new pastor came in and he says to them right off the bat, I'm here, and I'm here uh, like my first days or weeks or whatever are here. And he says, we're not going to have any troubles here. He says, I'm, I'm one for forgiving everybody. We are all going to start out with a clean slate. 
And we're going to just play some music here. And if anybody has anything, any kind of grudges against anybody, small or large, if you are willing to have God's Spirit in your heart, I want you, while the music is playing, to get up and go over to them and make your peace with them. Maybe you're not going to, you know, this morning be lovey-dovey and, and everything like great, you know, all that. But at least start the process. At least take those first steps to getting back to, to the relationship that you had. And I want, now he's told the, the person playing the organ, he says, you just play until I tell you to stop. And nobody did for a while. You know how it goes. Nobody did. Finally, someone got up. That first person, you, they deserve a medal. Because when they get up, other people perhaps get up and do. And I, I just, when I heard that story about him, I just thought, ah, what a cool thing to do. You know, it's tough for, for people to admit, but it is a really good thing that he gave them a forum in church to do that. Uh, the other place is not very uh, church-like. The other place where a lot of forgiveness happens are in the bars. Bartenders have probably seen more forgiveness of people than pastors have. People get in there and they don't know what started their troubles and they're sitting there and they're just, you know, drinking and, and something comes over them, whether it be alcohol or, or the, the spirit or whatever. And they look over and they walk over and they're sitting down and these two people that earlier had gone out and was ready to fight are now sitting there buying each other their drinks and got their hand arms around each other and for whatever reason bars I was a bartender for years I worked my way through college in a, in a uh, working as a bartender and um, I saw it how many people come in there bitter they sit down and whether it be the alcohol or the ambiance or maybe they sucked in too much cigarette smoke I don't know they are in a position then where they are okay with forgiving. I'm not, I'm, this is not a recommendation to go to a bar. Yeah, pastor said I was mad at somebody that I shouldn't take them and go to a bar and then we could forgive each other. No, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that. Psychologists say this, forgiveness. A conscious, deliberate decision to release all feelings of resentment or vengeance toward a person or a group who has harmed you, regardless of whether they actually deserve your forgiveness or not. A conscious, deliberate decision to let go of resentment, vengeance to a person or a group who has harmed you. You're going to do that. Release all that stuff. Let the vengeance go. Let the ill will go. You might have said, I wish they were dead, you know, a hundred times and all that, but you make a conscious, deliberate effort to forgive them. And I love where they're, like we're here, it says, you do that regardless of whether they actually deserve your forgiveness. That's forgiveness. One, one quick, one last story and I'm done. Because you can see here, we've talked, forgiveness appears easy. We read in the books here. We read in, in the different chapters here. We read, you know, Joseph. We read the prodigal son's dad, who is really God. He's in that parable. He's God running to, to try and do. But we also see some, some stone walls. We see 
the, the older son, the older brother, that, that would not try, uh, would, doesn't want to forgive. We see the, the, the lady in Max's story that doesn't want to forgive. Forgiveness would appear to be easy, right? Well, not always right. But we, we, we've seen some, some times when it was easy, and, and the people that were, were doing the forgiving were Joseph and basically God. And we saw some things where when it was unforgiven, it was just people. So, and it was family. That was the other part, is husband and wife, brother and brother. You know, we've seen where you need intervention. The, the, the guy said build a fence and they brought, they, the guy, he, he built them a bridge. Someone intervened on their behalf and got them back together. So forgiveness, uh, it appears to be easy. Sometimes it is. It appears to be hard, and sometimes it is. Two friends were in the desert. They had an argument. They were best friends. They were walking in the desert. And for some reason, they got into yelling at each other, and one of them turned and looked at his best friend and slapped him across the face. He's down in the sand. He looks around, and he, he sees a little stick, and he writes in the sand, Today my best friend slapped me. And he gets up, and they start walking. Uh, <clears throat> very quiet, not a lot of talk because they're angry with each other. They come up over a sand dune, and down there is an oasis. And they knew that they, were, would, they had a good chance now of being saved. So they went down there, and they're jumping in the water, and they're drinking, and they're fine, and everything seems to be going good. They're going to figure out what's our next move, what are we going to do. And the guy that got slapped earlier was running around, and he jumped up in the air, and he landed in a mud pit that was quicksand. And he's yelling out, hey, well, I'm sinking, I'm sinking. And the other guy just runs, leaps over, reaches down and grabs him, <clears throat> almost gets pulled in himself, risks his life. But eventually he pulls and pulls and wiggles and he gets his friend out. And they both lay there just exhausted. But he saved his friend's life. So he, the friend that was saved there goes over and he finds a rock and he finds a stick and it's it got like a little bit of a charcoal he, he puts down in the mud and he writes on the back of that stone it was a, a bigger rock he writes on the back of that today my best friend saved my life and the guy was a little bit stumped he uh, he says, why did you write earlier, my best friend slapped me out there in the sand, and then we get here and you write, my best friend saved my life on the back of this rock. I don't understand. Like, you know, I thought we were best friends and everything. I, I don't understand. And he says, well, um, when you're hurt, someone hurts your feelings or someone does something to you, you write it in the sand. But when someone does a good deed for you, like saving your life, you write that on the back of a stone because the winds of forgiveness will erase what was in the sand. But nothing can erase what's on the back of this stone. And all of a sudden then, the other friend understood. The things that we gripe about, the, the things that we say hurt us and, and that, that we're holding a grudge about, we write in the sand because the winds of forgiveness will blow that away and it'll be like it never happened. But if we write it on a stone, if we write it on something like that, it will never go away. So as we head, as you head forward, all of us, 
and, and I'm preaching to myself here too. You, a lot of these sermons come from things in your own family and such. But I'm, I'm just telling you today, forgiveness, it does appear to be easy. And it can be if you allow it. Lord, thank you for letting us speak here today. Thanks for the spirit of forgiveness that you give and, and we can take. Don't let our hearts be so hardened by a grudge that we don't forgive. This is what we hope, Lord, when we leave this place and head out into the world, into our lives. Amen.